Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome to our second 2023 ski comparison video. Uh, we got 90 millimeter up here today. Yeah, a nice transition from 100. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think the actual range is what, 87 to 92? Yep. Um, and there's certainly some similarities between this group and the 100 millimeter group that we started with, but some differences too. Yep. Um, you will kind of see I think some similar discussions as we go through. Right. You yeah. know, I'd say like a ski like the Mindbender 89Ti, there's a lot of similarities with the Mindbender 99Ti. Right. Kendo and Mantra, you know, stances and M pros and just kind of narrower siblings. Yep. Absolutely. We got a new narrow sibling over there, that Bent 90. Yep. That's a new. We got some good new skis on the wall, actually. Yeah. I got a new so, one over here that we're going to start with. Yep. I'm psyched. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think we'll just, we'll kick it off with that. Um, I have a brand new ski right here that to me is somewhat of an outlier in this category. Yep. Um, but we were kind of joking before we started filming. We do have what Bob and I would quantify as four and a half twin tips up here. And this is definitely squarely a twin tip. And even among the twin tip category, it's somewhat of an outlier. Yeah, definitely on that competition end of the spectrum. Yeah. So this is the brand new Vocal Revolt 90. Um, this is kind of replacing the Revolt 87. That's sort of the best way to think about it. That was their competition focused park ski. It was completely symmetrical um, and mostly camber in that ski. Yeah. Very, very poppy, very springy. Um, this is their new competition focused twin tip. It is again, completely symmetrical. Um, both in its side cut as well as its rocker profile. So you can actually see there's quite a bit of tip rocker in it. And then we get that same amount of tail rocker and the dimensions are completely symmetrical, 118, 90, 118. So this is a true, true competition park ski. Yep. Um, that isn't to say that you have to be competing on it, but that's at least how I think about it. Um, more and more people are using wider skis in the park, 100 underfoot, things with a lot of tip and tail rocker. That's great for things like butters and smeary tricks and kind of what I would consider even more new school than my era of park yeah. skiing. Um, very, very current style of skiing. This is more for it's weird to use this word, but more like your traditionalist park skier. Right. Somebody who's trying to kind of up their up their game, learn more tricks, more spins, more switch ups on rails, stuff like that. This ski is awesome for that. Um, something that Vocal's done is giving it this partial vertical sidewall, and then it goes to cap construction in the tips and tails. I think they call it what light light swing weight wood core. So you are getting quite a bit lighter in the tips and tails. That's making spins easier, stuff like that. We also get a nice, easy, forgiving flex pattern, especially up here in the tips yeah. and tails. Um, so awesome, awesome ski. I love stuff like this because it's kind of not what I grew up on, but a big part of my my skiing heritage, so to speak, is, is symmetrical twin tips like this. Yeah, and I think the addition of the taper makes a difference as well. I think that was, absolutely. you know, we've talked about that with these skis and other park skis where I think your, your, your old school traditionalist freestyle, we're really looking at a lack of taper. Yep. Um, whereas these do have some early taper and you kind of see it in the competitions with Big Air at least uh, where people are, you know, drifting and buttering off the jumps. Yep. You know, going into some 60 or 80 foot air off of their tips. Yep. And that taper, I think, you know, that's got to be athlete inspired where they're like, we know, we want something that's going to smear into the into this jump. A hundred percent. It also makes it less catchy specifically for switch takeoffs. Yeah. So if you've got like a really wide tip and a lot of camber, it can be really kind of catchy in the, like the last moment before you take off spinning switch. Right. And this makes that, it just, it just makes it quite a bit more forgiving and thus more confidence inspiring as a park skier, which is really nice. Right. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. When I first saw this ski, it was last season in Sun Valley. Um, 
primarily to look at the next ski we're going to talk about, the kendo, but they had this ski too, um, and Vocal was kind of presenting it to us as a group, and I like raised my hand at one point and was like, that's the best park shape I've ever seen. Right. And it, it really feels like they nailed it, um, but pretty one-dimensional too. Sure. You know, yeah. it is designed to be center mounted, like true dead center mount. And when you do that, definitely taking away some all mountain performance. So can you ski it as an all mountain ski? Sure. Will it have some limitations? Absolutely. Yeah. But, but really, me. really good for what it's designed for. Yeah. Top level park competition. That's what, that's what you want. And I'm sure that you reached for that revolt, but not too far behind was this Kendo. No, and actually, before we go too far, oh, the scale just turned off on me, but I was curious of the weight of this Revolt 90. 1,830 grams. At a 180, so yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty substantial, yep. but compared to the Kendo, 177, we're at 1,930 grams, so not like a huge difference. No, but um, I, they feel a lot different. Yeah, for sure. And certainly in terms of application, um, when we had that Mantra 102 up here last time, uh, that those same improvements filtered into this Kendo as well from what we've seen from Mantra M6 over the past year, uh, as, and then as well as the Secret 96. So moving into Kendo, we get tailored tightenal frame and tailored carbon tips. A little bit of an adjustment to the shaping as well, making this thing more turny, uh, more agile. Uh, you know, kind of the new Kendo definitely has more of that kind of energy to it. It's a lot less planky than it used to be back in the old 90 millimeter underfoot days. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's uh, just a huge improvement. You know, they make these incremental changes, but boy, when you get on this thing, it feels like a totally different ski. Um, a just, lot livelier. Yeah, super, super lively. Um, you know, they narrowed the metal up front here in the frame and then kind of went against that with that tailored carbon tip. So really increased that torsional rigidity up front while keeping it lighter. So it's easy to enter the turn. And then they took about a meter off the side cut underfoot. So this thing just really lights it up. You can stand right on this ski. Uh, you know, I kind of had an experiment this year doing 88 millimeter skis. So I had, did ski bum racing on a handful of these. Uh, and this one was really, really fun. Super confident, uh, easy to get up on edge, and then a strong kick at the end. So they you know, put a bigger gap in between the frames as well, allowing for a more natural flex. Still stiff. Oh, yeah. You know, like There's all of these there. changes that we're talking about being more friendly and more kind of recreational oriented doesn't take anything away from the top end of this thing. Uh, just a super high performance ski and now that it's got just a little bit more of a turny influence to it I just think it's going to strike a broader audience. Yeah, um, but overall just a really really great improvement for the kendo uh, You know good to see vocal kind of getting into this groove of things and there's nothing planky about this thing You know, it's no, just it, a really solid ski. It's easily my favorite kendo ever. Yeah, like, I didn't love when it was just two full sheets of metal. Right. And like you said, it was kind of planky, kind of like clunky. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's nothing clunky about this ski. It's very precise. It's very lively. Um, comes across the fall line a lot easier, just like dropping that one meter out of the center radius yeah. of the ski. The tips and tails are a little bit straighter, too. It's like really interesting. You know, it's almost like kind of hard to like conceptualize yeah. the shape differences between this ski and the old ski um, but yeah just a little bit straighter through the tips and tails that allows for slightly easier edge release so you mentioned it being turnier and i think that's true both in how it initiates and completes a carve and also how it makes shorter kind of more pivoting yeah. smearing style turns and we both had positive experiences uh, in soft snow on this ski. Yeah. You know, you had it in Sun Valley where there was a bunch of fresh snow. Yeah, it was like my powder ski for a day, which right. was funny, <laughs> but it, was, it worked great. Yeah, and I had it here at Snow in like, you know, three or four inches of snow. So yep. like even just getting, you know, letting it go through that on top of groomers was, was a very successful, you know, experiment in my mind. Yeah. 
awesome new improvements. Uh, you know, just makes this thing just a little bit better overall. You know, it's just a better, more suitable ski for a lot of skiers. Yeah, but. and you know, technically we started with that Revolt 90, but it kind of feels like this is really the start to this comparison. Right. And a great ski to start with. You know, if we can, if we if we kind of use this as our benchmark ski as we go through, I think there's yeah there's just it, it creates a lot of interesting conversations. Um, and I still think this is one of the most precise, responsive, like highest performing skis up here in how most people think of high performance skis. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. Yeah. But yeah, great job by Vocal, uh, tweaking that Kendo and just making it a much more precise ski without losing that top end. You know, I think that's the Key. balance that they're trying to, trying to get through. Um, this, you know, speaking of balance, I feel like that's a great word to describe this yep. ski. Um, this is the Storm Rider 88 from Stokely. Talk about high performance skis. That's a great transition from Kendo to Storm Rider 88 here, because this is a high performance ski yep. through and through. Um, but a lot of elements about it that make it fairly unique. Um, and I think they strike an excellent balance and you can say this about a lot of Stokely skis, probably starting with like the Montero AX or like Laser SC, all the way up through the Storm Runner 102, in the sense that they hit that high performance level, but they're pretty approachable too. Right. So it creates just this huge range of skiers that can enjoy it. Very lightweight core in this ski, like Karuba and Balsa, all that super lightweight stuff. Yeah. But then we get two sheets of metal and one of those sheets of metal is the actual top sheet of the ski, which is kind of another big Stokely thing. Right. You see that on a lot of their skis, at least all the Storm Rider, women's Nella, stuff like that. 1,750 grams. Right, so like 200 grams lighter than a Kendo. Yeah, which is very, very impressive. This is a 175, so a tiny bit shorter, but not, not a ton shorter. Right. But it's still pretty darn stiff. So... It's really cool. You know, we'll talk about some other skis as we go through here that strike a balance between being very, very lightweight and very stiff, but it gives the ski a pretty unique feel overall. Great vibration damping, great power, great edge grip, torsional stiffness is phenomenal, yeah. but then it's a little bit easier to kind of flick around. Um, and something that we've talked about quite a bit recently is where this sits in Stokely's line now because now we have the wider Montero AR, and this is starting to feel more like uh, the best choice for maybe like a Stokely skier who really likes moguls. Sure. Um, where that Montero is maybe taking over a little bit of the carving side of the spectrum. This ski is, is very well-rounded as an all-mountain ski. Yeah, and you notice it more when we had this and the Montero AR up on the wall you know, when they were just lying flat like this, you could tell it in the camber. Yeah. You know, so like that Montero just bows out. Right. Whereas this thing is a lot flatter. I mean, it still has camber underfoot. Certainly not a whole lot of tail rocker. No, there's really not much rocker in it at all. No, it's it's definitely has more of that flatter profile. Yeah. Um, you know, very business-like tail. And, you know, when you were flexing that 102 last time, uh, especially in the shovel, you know, we still get some of that with the 88. Yeah, but I think this is, is it's considerably different. stiffer. Yep, it's different. Yeah. But when you're comparing it to that Montero AR, uh, or even something similarly quiet like uh, Evolve 90, uh, it definitely has that same type of you know on-trail persona. Yeah. But uh, with that flatter profile, I think that's super helpful for softer snow, moguls, trees. Stuff yeah, like really, that. I mean, overall, a lot of similar characteristics to the Kendo. Yeah. They both kind of lean more towards the precision side of the spectrum rather than like a QST 92 yeah. or a Blade Optic 92 or some of these skis that really start to focus more on quickness and maneuverability and, and tree skiing and moguls and stuff like that. Yeah. I do think this is a probably the best mogul ski that Stokely makes, uh, but it's still among this collection of skis and among this category, it's still a precision oriented ski yeah for sure but a lot of people love it like we hear from so many different skiers that 
absolutely love this thing. Yeah. Intermediates all the way up through like the best of the best expert skiers. Yeah, and for how light it is, and we can talk about this with core as well, uh, it's surprising how stiff and how reactive it is as well. So, yeah. you know, they just do a great job of blending those attributes. Yep, absolutely. And this one, new, new Scott ski for us. Uh, this is the Pure Free 90. Uh, this is the 184. Jeff's going to put it on the scale here. And we're over 2,000 grams or 2070 grams, uh, which is, you know, on the heavier side. There's definitely some, some beef to this ski. Yeah, you were pointing it out just yesterday. The core thickness of this yeah. ski is, is very interesting. And that's pretty consistent from tip to tail. I mean, yeah. it's a fairly simple poplar wood core. Yeah, if you um, like, I mean, what a, what a stark contrast right. between thickness of skis. Right, especially in the, like the tips here. Right, the Stokely's so thin. Yeah. Very interesting. And so you just see more mass kind of in that, I don't know, the height of the ski, I guess we, yeah. we could call it. But, um, you know, they do that in order to increase the stability. Uh, and they don't need to put a whole lot of other materials in here. They do have this tightenal sheet underfoot, um, which is not only binding retention, but also energy absorbent. But it's not like they have two full sheets of metal in this thing, and that's putting it over 2,000 grams. Um, but as a result, we're getting something that's on the stiffer side of the spectrum, too. Yeah. There's just a lot of wood in this thing. Uh, and that really adds to the overall performance and character of it. So, you know, Liberty as well, I would put up there. With that thicker core profile, they, they're using that technique of construction in order to get the stability and power out of the ski. Uh, we also get some nice good camber underfoot here as well. So, you know, that's kind of how they do it. You know, a little bit of splay here at the tail, not a ton. They got a skin fixation notch, which for an seems, over 2,000 gram yeah. ski seems a little strange. I mean, I'll but. just go ahead and say that's like <laughs> weird. But You oh, could do it, but... You can do it, but well, you're going to be why? lugging some lumber up, <laughs> up the hill. Um, but, you know... This ski just fits really squarely in the middle of all of these things. Very, and very well rounded, yeah. We said that about the Mission 98, and that seems yep. to be what we've found from Scott so far to be, you know, kind of their calling card is they're making intuitive skis that feel good on people's feet. Yeah. They don't quite excel in one area or another. Um, you know, test day for us this year was a deep snow day. Uh, you know, no issues with this thing going through the woods in deep snow at all. Definitely some, you know, everyone we had out on this was pretty impressed with yeah. how this thing handled softer snow. I was surprised how easy it was to ski yeah. in situations like that. You know, it, it's still like kind of a flatter tail yeah. than some of the skis up here, but there's more tip rocker in this ski, especially compared to the last two skis we looked at, the Kendo and the Storm Rider, and I found that that just gave it just a more intuitive, easier feel. Right. Like I skied, I think I skied Upper National, or maybe the whole The thing, whole thing. The whole National, yep. all National. Um, and if you've skied Stowe, you'll know that that's like, it's not the steepest thing on the mountain, but it's got some pitch to it, and then it's a mixture of like firm moguls and ice and just like weird random stuff and yeah. some rocks that you'll hit. No, it's a real trail. Yeah. Yeah. And I I found it was pretty easy to just kind of bop my way down the trail on yep. that thing. So I really like that. Yeah. And, and I think that the ski being able to handle mixed conditions is a good barometer of its overall 100%. composure and character. And yep. when you have that type of condition with soft snow on top of firm snow with other stuff and you felt confident, then that speaks volumes to the way that Scott's building these skis, and I think pretty directly to the core thickness, which is yeah. certainly one of the one of the superlatives of, of this one right here. Well, and if you talk to ski engineers, they'll tell you that like core thickness matters a lot. Yeah. Like you can control the flex pattern of a ski more through just how you're milling the core to different thicknesses yeah. than adding materials like metal or carbon or stuff like that. Like if you think about a single sheet of thin metal, right. it's just going to be like, like if we had a piece of 0.7 millimeter tightenal right now, it would just be all floppy. But it's the thickness of the right. wood. Like if you had a sheet of wood that was a centimeter thick, it's not going to really bend. Yeah. So. And I think this is a good, 
a good contrast. Totally. Uh, this Atomic Maverick 88, which uses that thinner core material plus two sheets of metal yep. to achieve a pretty different feel Very different. than this Scott. Yeah. Um, you know, when this has our plate binding on it, but it is, I mean, this ski is razor thin yeah. compared to that Scott and most other things on the wall. So I would say this is a good, a good opposition to that one right there. Um, next ski up here is the new Solomon QST-92. Um, boy, a great ski. This might be one of my favorite skis up here on this wall. Just from like a raw, just amount of enjoyment you get out of skiing it. That's a get on it and go. It is so unseen. much fun. Yep. Yeah. You've probably heard Bob and myself also, but this is really a, a Bob phrase if you don't know what ski to buy just buy this right and you've said that we've said that about other things too like rip sticks there are other skis that kind of fall under that category but this ski does everything really well yeah you know it's not the best specifically in like carving performance i would say almost every ski out up here comes close to outperforming it as a carving ski but boy it's so much fun just quick agile playful and just puts a smile on your face like pretty much anywhere you take it um, so this ski receives the same changes that we first saw in the qsd 98 and the black blank for last season yeah it's really confusing yeah, when you start thinking about the years <laughs> and seasons so for the for this upcoming season um, which we started to see this past season <laughs> the 92 and the 106 get those changes as well so different tip shape, you get a lot more taper. They kind of extended the rocker profile before I take it off the scale, just over 1800 grams. And I believe this is the yeah 176. So one of the shorter lengths up here, but still impressively lightweight. Yeah. Um, and if you look at that rocker profile, you know, they've really kind of lengthened the rocker profile compared to the outgoing QST 92. And that remains consistent across the entire QST range. Quite a bit of tail rocker too you know it's we're almost getting like getting close to like 50 percent rocker in this ski yeah and taper too so we get all this early taper and that is partially responsible for the fact that we have a 15 meter turn radius in this ski right. so when you have this much rocker this much taper and a 15 meter turn radius this thing absolutely loves to turn and does really really well in soft snow yeah same turn radius as that ski yep. A lot of similarities. This ski is wider underfoot and through the shovel. Yeah. So I think that's like specifically in, in comparison to that ski, I think that's where the biggest difference is. But boy, I had this, I had a fun day on this ski, I think in Pico, and then I had a blast on this ski in Alta. Ski to that Stowe too, but that Pico and, and the Alta experiences really stick out in my mind. Great in soft snow, great in the trees, super quick. Super playful. You can like ski backwards on it if you want. I don't think we included this in our four and a half twin tips, but 4.75 twin tips sure. is just a quarter of a twin tip. That's fair to say. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just a pleasure to ski. Yeah, they do a great job with it overall. And you know what we talked about with that QST 98 in terms of having a surprising amount of stability and dampness. I think this one yes. does as well. They just do a great job. CFX super fiber. That CFX material that, you know, that poplar wood core, the thicker sidewall underfoot. I yeah. mean, they just have a lot of different things thrown into this ski that combine really well with the shape and the rocker profile yeah. to just make it that super approachable and friendly ski. Yeah. Um, sister company down there, Atomic, like that Bent 90 when we get there, We'll talk about how that's a great example of how you can just take a wood core and yep. get the shape right and you're good. You've yep. got a really fun ski. This is like kind of the other side of that spectrum where there's a lot of technology in this ski. There's a lot of different materials. Yep. The engineering behind this ski is, is quite a bit different than just a wood core. And it definitely comes through in its performance. And Solomon's kind of that type of company where they really put a bunch of stuff in there, very kitchen sink oriented. Like, yeah. let's throw a bunch of stuff in here and right. make it all work together. And for the most part, they're very successful. Yeah. Um, I feel like you might think that it's like kind of too narrow for a West Coast application, but 
I thought it did great in Alta. Yeah, it's a great floater. I Joe's, mean, they really yeah. have that taper dialed. Yep. Um, Joe Johnson, Solomon marketing manager, he skied it out there yep. and, and had a blast on it. Um, yeah, it's just really good. Definitely floats beyond its width. I would agree. Um, and yep. then it's a little quicker, you know, especially if you were to compare it to like the QSD 98, this is quicker edge to edge. Mm -hmm. So if you're in tight trees, a little narrow chute or something like that, you're going to get a little bit quicker turns out of this ski, which sometimes a tiny bit of quickness goes a long way in those scenarios. Yeah. And I just think it's funny that after reviewing hundreds of skis over the course of the year that we still <laughs> settle on that one. Or at least I do. As just being As like just, really, really fun. Yep, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. You know, it's it's it always sticks out for me. It's awesome. And like not as many people will buy this as they should. Right. Like we've talked about it before. Like if ski companies all got together and said, All right, we're done with this, we're making <laughs> one ski and you have to buy that one ski. Right. Like that would be one of the top choices. Yep. Not to discredit this next ski. Yeah, we got this Stance 90, which, you know, you had mentioned carving on the QST 92, and I think that... As its drawback, it's one downside. Right, and sure, I think that's that that this, just this pops. takes it and, yeah. Yeah, when I think about carving on wide open terrain, I have very fond memories of our trip to Alta, and, uh, you know, it looked like you were having as much fun as humanly possible on any ski imaginable on any trail possible. <laughs> Turns out it's a great place to ski. No, yeah. but it, just to speak to the QS92 again real quick, they both truly feel like all mountain skis. It's right. just one leans more towards like a free ride style, that leans more towards a precision carving style of skiing. Yeah. And while both remaining like impressively versatile. Yeah, and this one definitely has that higher speed limit and that more 100%. stability at that speed. Yeah. Anytime you're trying to push a 15 meter turn radius ski past its comfort point, point right. it'll let you know. Yeah, this thing can, I mean, the, the Stance 90 can ski right next to a Kendo or a Storm Rider 88 yeah. and keep up without any issues. Yeah. Maybe not quite as precise as those skis, but there's a little bit more like, <clears throat> excuse me, f like free ride influence to that ski. Sure. Uh, while still, it can still hang among those two sheets of metal skis, Kendo, Storm Rider, Enforcer 88, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, this is the 188, so this is the big one, 2,020 grams just about. So definitely north of that 2,000 gram mark for this length. Once you get down to 182, 176, you'll probably be a little below that. Uh, but it's all there, you know, it's got the wood core, the two sheets of metal. They use similar philosophies as Vocal with the yep. framing technique. Um, so by putting their, you know, CFX fibers in the open window areas, right. they're able to really increase the energy and snap out of this one uh, while keeping the power and precision to the edges. So it's a, you know, smart way of building skis, similar to the QST where they're putting a lot of stuff and technology into it. Uh, that certainly follows through with this. A yep. uh, little bit more of a traditional uh, profile and shape, though. But we do get some good rocker, you know, especially in the tail, uh, sorry, in the tips here. Uh, and you had also had a good experience out there in some fresh and softer snow, you know, kind of days old, but still it was untouched and windblown. And yeah, no, and that ski did no great. Issues. I give a lot of credit to the tip and tail shape. Yeah. You know, it doesn't like, it doesn't just hook up. So it lets right. you kind of do those drifty turns when you want to. Um, yeah, super fun. Yeah. And I think they've, they, they complement each other nicely, the stance and the QST. Right. So much so that you could own both. Yeah, no, totally. Like very different personalities. And I think they've done a good job at separating uh, those two lines, Stance and QST. Uh, we talked about it in the other video with the QST 98 and the Stance 102. Yeah. Uh, and you can include Stance 96 in that conversation as well. That they're just, they're certainly different enough uh, to warrant having the two. Yep. Um, but just a great overall option for a skier that's looking for, you know, top flight groomer performance with off trail versatility. Um, you know, it's not quite the powerhouse that Brahma 88 is, but it's also not multiple steps below. No, you know, maybe you're, one step. Right, like a Brahma minus. Sure. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it still has the power and strength to, you know, go with that high performance skiing. Feels a lot like 
the changes to this ski. Yeah, no, I agree. That that Stance 90 and the new Mindbender 89, they they really feel like they're going in a similar direction yeah. of benefiting from metal and their construction, having really strong carving performance. But then it just kind of like it matches at least my perception of the brands better. Yeah. Like it doesn't need to be a Brahma because that's like to me not what Solomon's all about as a company or at least not the free ride side of Solomon's company. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I think both of those skiers, they're, they're strong players in the performance 90 underfoot all mountain category but they do it with their own attitude, which I really appreciate. Yeah, and at the top end, there aren't too many skiers that are gonna be pushing this ski beyond its limits. You know, it's no, very I don't think, strong. I don't think anyone's really pushing it past its limits. I think it would more be, <clears throat> more be a discussion of like its responsiveness and its yeah. precision. I could see somebody preferring the feel of a Brahma or the feel of a Kendo, and that person probably spends a bigger percentage of their time on groomed slopes yeah and like really maybe they like film themselves and like really work on their technique and stuff like that yeah. kind of like ski instructor style skiing where it's very analytical i could see that type of skier preferring the more precise skis where this ski is a little bit looser while not giving up the like top end stability yeah but still top end. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and I appreciate that it comes in the 188 as well. In a bob length. Yeah. Um, next ski we have up here is the Enforcer 88. Uh, no changes to this ski for the upcoming ski season, aside from this new top sheet graphic. Um, this ski is interesting, you know. I think as companies evolve their skis, as we get more and more stuff in this category, it might it maybe is like repositioning this ski in the whole the whole group well yeah i think that these are changing and uh -huh, this exactly. has stayed i don't want to say stagnant with negative connotations but no uh the overall philosophy of enforcer 88 has not changed since inception right and it's still it's still extremely versatile it just yeah it has it has a bit of a different feel than some of the skis yeah. up here um, and I think in, in more ways than not, that's a good thing. Right. Um, so it is a pretty hefty ski. This is a 179. We're just over 2,000 grams. Of course, we get two sheets of metal in this ski. Really wouldn't be an enforcer if we didn't have those two full sheets of metal. Yeah. And then true enforcer shaping concept. Um, so this pretty long tip rocker that like it's almost not even early taper it's just gradual straightening of the tip yeah the more you tip it up on edge the longer your effective edge gets so the harder you ski it the stronger the ski feels which is basically the whole concept behind these skis right throughout the entire enforcer line much less tail rocker but there's enough tail rocker back there say a little bit more actual taper just in the very end of the tail here and that helps you not feel super locked in which I think is key on this ski and then 16.5 meter turn radius so it is a shorter radius ski than some of the things up here and it it definitely comes through in how it skis so I really like this ski because it doesn't feel like it has a speed limit but I find it really easy to control your speed without like breaking out of a carve, without releasing your tail edge mm -hmm. or anything like that, because it comes across the fall line so easily, you can just keep carving and keep carving and keep carving. And like, it's, it's not forgiveness in the traditional way of how we use that word, but I do think there's some forgiveness to this ski while still being very, very top end. Yeah. It's really interesting. And there's some quickness to it, too. So it wasn't, I don't believe it was this past season. I believe it was the previous season. But I had, I, I maybe skied this ski for like a week straight while we were testing it. And skied a lot of, like, did a lot of short turns on the side of the trail and, and stuff like that. And it always impresses me how agile this ski is. So you get that, like, really fun, responsive, round carving performance. But then you can take it off trail, too. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's a very similar conversation really to 
what we just talked about with the Stance 90 in comparison to Kendo's and Brahma's and stuff like that, where it's right there with them for stability and power, but it does feel at least easier when you take it off trail. And it, I, that said, it, to me, it, it feels quite a bit different than the Stance 90. I think this prefers to make quicker and shorter turns, where that Stance 90 likes more big, open, sweeping turns. Yeah. I think this is an interesting one because it's the narrowest of the free ride collection. Right. You know, so it ca it's a narrow free ride ski. Right. You it's know, derived it's, from a ski that's 100 under foot. Yeah. It wasn't designed independently. Right. It, they literally took a ski that was designed to be 100 under foot and shrunk it in every dimension and were like, here you go. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think that's interesting to think about now, especially given right. some of this other stuff that we have up here. And a no, lot I, of these do count as the narrowest version of a free ride ski. Ranger 90? Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they're all pretty close, even like Kendo 88, right. you know, derived from the Mantra and Mantra 102. Right. Even Katana 108. You know, they're similar siblings, but in different widths. Um, you know, I think that it's also important to note that there are like 86s, a Wingman 86 or Fisher RC1 GT 86 that are... Which are, are the widest the of widest the carving of the skis. carving skis. Yeah. So there's like just a tiny gap between th th those and these, you yep. know, the, the wide carvers and the narrow free ride skis. Um, so this does have that personality of a free ride ski, but I mean, boy, does it want, it just, it wants to go. Yeah, you know, it's super, super fast, you know, in terms of, you know, feel, we're going to pull this Brahma out again, uh, just in terms of overall, you know, strength and power and stability. Uh, you know, these two are right up there with each other, which is, you know, speaking highly of both of them for sure. Yeah, there's just, I think there's some the pretty significant differences in the shape yeah. between Brahma and Enforcer. And that's where you're really feeling the difference. Right. And thinner metal in here, too. So it's a little bit, you know, if we, if I could flex the Brahma <laughs> at the same time, this is a tiny, tiny bit softer. Yeah. But really cool ski and just interesting. You know, I'm kind of interested in where they go from here. I think we I talked just, about that with Enforcer 100. I was just going to say, yeah, what do you do from here? Right. Because, like, they pretty much nailed it. Yep. From the start, how do you how do you change something that's already really really good? Yeah, I don't know. That's not up to me. Well, they could keep it the same, and then lots of other ski companies make really fun other skis, like the next one we got. Well, right, and that's kind of how we started that conversation yeah. with the Enforcer. Is it, it? It is. It has been interesting, like viewing it through the lens of each ski season. Right, because things change, and I think. A lot of skis are kind of catching up to it, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so it is. Yeah, I'd say if, if this year it feels a little different talking about that ski for whatever reason. Yeah, I mean, I could only see them making moves towards what Vocal did with Kendo. Sure. You know, like I feel like that enforcer. More refinement. Yeah. Now that kind of takes the plankier spot on the yeah. on the wall. Right. Uh, whereas that used to be a, a squarely a Kendo technique. Yes. But now they've kind of altered they've that. They've kind of swapped. Yeah. Yep. And this is, I would say, kind of in the total other end of the spectrum. Um, line Blade Optic 92. Uh, totally new ski for this year. Uh, this was our half twin tip. This is our half twin tip. So this is making up the half of the 4.75 twin tips on the wall. Yep. And a really great addition uh, to the ski industry as a whole. Yep. Uh, this is taking the spot, the Blade Optic line is taking the spot of where Sick Day uh, was. So this 92 is a, a pretty even swap between the 88 and the 94 that are outgoing. Uh, and this is the only Blade Optic that doesn't use metal in its construction. Certainly um, reflected in that weight figure down there. 1,700 grams here. This is what, 170 five um so yeah definitely one of the lighter skis on the wall um and certainly one of the quickest most agile most playful uh very very nice job here by combining that thicker core underfoot you can really see it with that bright green here uh, and then tapering into cap construction in the tips and tails uh, no coincidence they have started the rocker 
where that merges into cap. So from sidewall to cap, and then the rocker goes from there. And we see that in the tail as well. So this is your half twin tip right here. You know, definitely a lot of that splay comes from the rocker rather than like what uh, Vocal does with Revolt 90 or Faction does, which is, you know, having that splay be at the end of the ski. Yep. Um, <clears throat> definitely built into the rocker and soft snow performance. But great grip underfoot, you know, 92 millimeters with that, with those lighter tips and tails. Uh, really awesome floater and very energetic. Um, you know, on paper, I'm more of a, a, of a Blade Optic 96 skier with the metal laminate in there, but this on was, snow... I recall you saying this was your favorite. This is my favorite Blade Optic, so yeah. go figure. You know, you can be a larger, more aggressive skier and still have a great time on a ski without metal. So that's kind of, you know, a big plus for this ski right here. Uh, and just the overall playfulness and adaptability uh, really stood out for me. You know, just super intuitive, really easy to ski. And I really liked that Sick Day 94 as well. I thought yep. that was really energetic and fun. And yeah, poppy. you always spoke fondly of those sick days. Yeah, and then this just, you know, puts a new level of playfulness and free ride influence to it. So, yep. similar to Solomon, I think we're looking at a fantastic tree ski here. Uh, for where we are here in Vermont, lots of tight woods. Something like this is able to make those subsequent quick turns that can allow you to take more aggressive line and just have more fun. So it's... There just, are a ton of similarities with the QST-92 now that you mentioned that. Yeah. It's almost like a, a QST-92 that's just a little bit more of a twin tip. Yeah. And you can feel, you know, that shovel from where it goes from cap to uh, sidewall to cap. You know, you can feel a big difference in the thickness uh, and the flex due to that core. So it is, you know, a very marketed difference between that cap flex and then the sidewall flex. Yep. And, and then, a, a cool ski in the sense that it can be a, a favorite for somebody like Bob, who's, you know, directional mogul tree skier, all mountain skier. When I was at USASA Nationals, and I think we mentioned this in the Blade Optic video, um, I saw a few line athletes skiing park on that and mm -hmm. then kind of talked to talk to the guys at line and they were like, yeah, actually a lot of people have been like kind of gravitating towards it as their park ski, well, which is kind of interesting. Think about Revolt 90 and that light swing weight wood core. Right. Same theory. They're putting the mass underfoot, which means that the tips and tails are going to be lighter and you're, and you're spinning and you have a better balance. Yeah, and actually to bring that Revolt 90 back up, I think I used the word like traditionalist to describe that. This is actually a really good example of the, the contrasting style of park ski and, and more of like what I consider to be a modern park ski is there are more and more park skiers who are kind of just like doing it for fun, yeah. which sounds silly, but just less of a like less of a goal mindset. Like they don't have like certain tricks that they're trying to learn. They're just trying to have the most fun, which like kudos to those skiers because they've figured it out. They yeah. didn't go through a couple decades of trying too hard, <laughs> but more and more skiers are choosing a ski like this. You know, you're, it's not as good for the high level, super crazy tricks, but really fun if you're just cruising around in the park, looking to have a good time, and then you get the all-mountain benefits too. Right. So it's like, this is certainly a growing category of skis, which is kind of exciting to watch. And like, play, like mountain as playground or terrain park, 100%. not like terrain yeah. park specific, but using natural features and, yep. the, and the natural terrain. Yeah, doing little nose butters, yeah. stuff like that. Yep. But, but then you can go slide some rails on it too if you want to. And just kind of do whatever you want, make the mountain, yeah. leave your own personal signature out there on the mountain. Um, next up is the Liberty Evolve 90. Uh, super fun ski. Gosh, it's been around for a while now. Um, we now get VMT 3.0, so vertical, med vertical, medical, vertical metal technology 3.0, which means we get those three vertical metal struts. Um, there is a really cool kind of like window where you can see what's happening in the ski. 
but basically there's one right in the middle and then there's two kind of symmetrically on either sides of that. We've talked about that vertical metal quite a bit. Rosignol was using it for yeah. a few years. Liberty has seemed to, they've found a winner, at least for them, for construction techniques in this vertical metal because we're seeing it through, gosh, 90% of their skis, 80% of their skis, yeah, something like it. that, a lot. Yeah. A lot of their skis use vertical metal now. I think only the Helix don't off the top of my head or Origin BC. Um, but anyways, this is... Liberty's take on like a Kendo yep. or a Storm Rider 88. Um, it is right there in that category. Stiff, strong, powerful ski, very, very good counter flexing. We talked about in that 100 comparison. So the ski doesn't have a tendency to kind of waffle or, yeah. or have that slow flap. You get really good, consistent contact with the snow. That then gives you really good control. That turns into a lot of confidence. So just a very fun ski and, and one of those things that like kind of makes you feel like a better skier. 1,750 grams. So maybe that's the best example of some of the benefits of vertical metal. So if right. you think about the actual amount of metal in this ski compared to a ski with horizontal traditional metal laminates, there's much less of it here bamboo in this ski too liberty uses a lot of bamboo they have poplar too so it's not just bamboo but you still get a pretty strong ski here yeah. it's just they're able to keep that weight down quite a bit um, but stiff powerful not really much rocker to speak of it's kind of got just that like flat look through the tip maybe one of the flatter tips which i always think is interesting um, and certainly more of a flat, squared off tail. So finishes a turn really well. You can get a nice, clean, round carving arc. But for some reason, and I probably would give at least 90% of the credit to the weight, I do find this ski is a little bit more maneuverable and a little bit more agile, I'd say compared to Kendo's, even maybe compared to an Enforcer 88. Um, there's something about this ski that lets you throw it sideways and it doesn't like complain. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense considering where Liberty is based. You know, Colorado company, they have a lot of that like open wind buffed right. terrain. And this ski does a really good job of making nice clean carves on, on groomers, but then you can take it off trail into wind buff terrain and the ski's not going to feel like it's fighting you not as loose as an origin but there's some certainly some playfulness to it i have never once wanted to throw this thing sideways or any of the evolved series skis <laughs> they can like, do it though they can do it but that has never been something that i've thought of like from the first time i got on this before 3.0 was just instantly blown away at how much it wanted to be on edge because it has such a long effective edge yes you know, the minimal taper, the minimal rocker make it so smooth. Um, you know, the weight, I think, makes you want to go sideways. That's, that's why I gave it 90% yeah. of the credit. And totally, totally, you know, valid in that. But my experience has led me to want to be on edge in a mid-range, mid-radius carved turn. Yep. From top to bottom. Yep. And in that sense, like, I really haven't found anything smoother or quieter than these Evolve Series skis, um, you know, the use of bamboo plus that thicker core just add up to a, a completely silent experience. It is very quiet. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. And even more so, like, comparing it to our next ski, if we can just transition to that sure. a little bit, with a very similar overall shape from tip to tail. Much different weight. Very different weight and a very different experience. Um, so Kessley does really interesting things with their MX-88 here. Uh, this is what, the 173, uh, 1875 grams. Yeah, so we picked up about 150 grams there, yeah. if I remember correctly. Um, and that's where your full sheets of vertical metal come into play. Uh, but really similar, you know, tail shapes as well. Uh, as well as rocker profile. So we're getting that long effective edge from both that Liberty and the Kessley, but vastly different sounds and 
characters and personalities from these two skis. Yeah, I was watching some footage yesterday and you weren't even looking at the screen and you were like, that's a Kessley. Yeah, you can tell the sound of this thing pretty easily uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is hollow tech. Yep. Um, they remove a lot of the mass from the shovel of the ski here. And that, you know, with less mass comes less vibrations. So it's a vibration reduction as well as making it a little bit lighter to get, you know, from, from turn to turn quicker. Uh, and then the other part is their use of fiberglass. So one of the differences between this Kessley MX-88 and last year's is that addition of a pre-preg fiberglass laminate. So they've made it more consistent, uh, just a little bit more efficient for them to make these skis and slightly stiffer, I would say, but it's really hard to tell. It is a it, stiff ski though. Yeah, it's a stiff ski, you know, especially once you get into that midpoint. Um, you know, with that, with that hollow tech, we are getting a little bit of a movement from the shovel there, but uh, for the most part, this is a very kind of race inspired ski with thicker metal, uh, uh, sorry, thicker wood, denser wood through the center core, and then a little bit lighter wood on the outsides. So keeping that central part very damp, very stable, while keeping it a little bit lighter. But overall, I would say that this is probably the strongest carving ski the most front side oriented model on the wall here uh, and just totally unflinching in its edge grip and its ability to rebound. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to agree with you. Like, I could see some folks at Blizzard being like, no, Brahma carves Brahma better. Brahma carves better. <laughs> and maybe some of you guys would, would agree with that too. But it's just like, it's, it's mostly that. Yeah. That flat, squared off tail really gives this ski a distinct personality and kind of has some similarities with this ski too but a lot of the weight difference kind of changes changes their characteristics so it's they don't quite feel the same i find this ski leans more towards carving this ski feels a little bit more versatile yeah well and it's not it's not as powerful as the mx88 yeah it's and it's great how they've done it. And when we had the MX-98 up here last time, you know, we put them together and said, well, they have a little bit of tip rocker, but you could make a very strong argument that that is a fully cambered ski. Yep. Um, so you're getting that long effective edge like the Liberty. You're getting the snap and energy out of the camber built in. You know, some skis like uh, Prodigy 1 here have a ton of camber but they also don't have metal. So they're using right. camber. And it gives it such a different feel. To give it energy. It's a different purpose. Yeah, and they're doing that to make up for a lack of metal, whereas Kessley is adding the camber to the metal. So they're kind of doubling down on that performance attribute for that, for that ski right there. Do you think it's fair to say it's somewhat demanding? Y yes, certainly in order to access the, the top of the performance. Um, I think that it is not as demanding as Brahma, or at least you don't have to work quite as hard, but yeah. certainly that tail will let you know that it is there. That's the big thing that I was, was thinking of is that yeah. tail. We had a, a pretty good soft snow day with Kessley this year, and I skied this quite a bit. Yeah. And there were definitely some moments where like, it didn't necessarily bother me, but I certainly noticed how locked in that tail was. Right. And in conditions like that, sometimes it can be a little bit nerve wracking, but. Yeah, are you throwing that thing sideways like you're throwing your Liberty sideways? No, no. Not with as much confidence at yeah. least. So, you, and, you know, you're getting that, you're getting the quality and the precision and the performance, you know, similar to how we see in Stokely. Um, just a different, it's just a different feel. Yeah. You know, certainly more of a, of a race car feel from that Kessley. Yes, 100%. So last key, at least on this side of the wall, is the K2 Mindbender 89 Ti. Um, we did a full review of this ski a while back. K2 really took the overall theme of the Mindbender collection, carried that forward, and just did some you know, I'd say fairly minor tweaks or refinements to the TI models, starting yeah. with this 89 TI, going up all the way through the 108 TI. 
Um, so a little bit different application of metal. It's still tight in a Y beam, much like how vocal is kind of just changing the shape of the metal. K2 is too. So it kind of juts out into wider metal right here in the forebody of the ski, then gets narrower here, full width underfoot, and then actually kind of the same thing in the tail. It's narrower through this portion, then juts out kind of right at the end, kind of right right where the rocker starts in this ski. Yeah. Um, so quite a bit of metal in this ski. It gives it a pretty strong feel. Uh, you can probably tell that the flex pattern's a little softer than some of the skis we've looked at. MX-88, Stance, actually quite a few of the skis we've looked at so far. And there's also more rocker in this ski too. So quite a bit of tip rocker there. And then a reasonable amount of tail rocker too. Certainly not much splay back here, so you're still going to retain pretty long effective edge, especially when you're up at a high edge angle, but it's there. The length of rocker is there, so that gives this ski a little bit more maneuverability. Um, and, you know, I think the best way to think about the Mindbender 89Ti among this group of skis, it is, it, it is a true, true all-mountain ski. If you talk about skis with an even mix of performance characteristics. Mindbenders have always been in that yeah. discussion, and I think this continues that trend, and if anything, takes it to another level. I think the carving performance is a little bit better in this ski. I love the more consistent feel from the true vertical sidewall throughout the whole ski. That was another change to construction. Yeah, um, yeah it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's very similar to the Stance 90 in how it does a little bit of everything. It can carve, it's got good vibration damping, good strength, but you can take it off trail too. Um, and a little bit lighter, so 1,850 grams in this mind bender. I believe that Stance was over 2,000, at least in the long in length. The long length, yeah. Um, and even if we had comparable lengths, the ski is, is a little bit lighter. Yeah. So you benefit from a little bit more, a little bit more quickness, um, but Super fun. Yeah. We had a few great days on this ski. Had a blast on that thing. Yeah. I had a lot of fun just making some fun, easy carves on it. Yep. You had it on like a powder day. We've got some really cool footage of you skiing some deep snow on it. Great. So a lot, a <laughs> lot of different stuff you can do on this Mindbender 89. Yeah. And I think it's cool to notice that it's more rockered than the outgoing 90. Yes. Is a better carving ski. Yeah. So, you know, they've definitely between the metal, the sidewall, the shorter turn radius, they've definitely improved the overall character in terms of an all-mountain ski. The the way that the side cut extends into the tail, yeah. I feel like is is kind of a, a noticeable difference. And I kind of, at this point, I wish we had an old mind bender with us right now to look at that difference, but yeah. it just juts out a little bit more, so it has more of a little bit more oomph as you're kind of completing a carving turn. I got shot out of the corners on that thing a few times that I was not prepared for. Great feeling. So I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, next up on this side of the wall, Headcore 87. Uh, we had the 99 in the previous video. Uh, I would assume that 93 will make it into the mid 90s uh, comparison. Boy, you'd, yeah, you'd think so. You'd think that like Head designed these, that they could have a ski right in the middle of each of our <laughs> videos, but uh, this ski gets a minor update for this year, so uh, they put a top sheet on it, which it hadn't really had before. That was always one of their weight-saving techniques to keep this thing super light. It's uh, like, what? it doesn't seem like they needed a weight-saving technique. No. <laughs> their use of lightweight, you know, the Karuba wood and the carbon, totally. uh, take care of that. 1,617 grams. This is the 177 centimeter reference length so right not like this is a tiny ski nope um, but definitely I believe it's the lightest ski on this wall and like we've said before with the other cores also probably one of the stiffest yeah very um, interesting certainly the ratio of lightweight to stiffness is yep. at the at the highest or most even <laughs> I don't know ratio is so good but. well last year and we'll probably do that this year we organized the wall by weight and this was the lightest, and then yeah. we also organized a wall by stiffness, and this was the stiffest. Right. So, yeah, 
whatever that means. Yeah, but is it 10 to one or one to one? I don't know. I don't know. But either way, <laughs> uh, super quick, super agile, very responsive. Uh, the way that they put that carbon in there, you know, the top part is curved. And anytime you're putting carbon or fiberglass or anything like that in a three-dimensional application, it certainly stiffens the overall nature of it. And that is what you're getting with this. So by curving that top laminate of carbon to match the sidewalls, they're really making this thing super reactive. Uh, and it works. I think that top sheet also just makes it a little quieter. Uh, we noticed a, a not insignificant you know, upgrade in the vibration, the damping. vibration damping. I think that that top sheet goes a long way in helping that out. Yeah, um, still not as smooth as these heavier right. metal clad skis over here. No, but if you're looking for something quick and agile and easy to get up on edge, uh, this is the one, you know, it, yeah. it, each and every movement you put into it is pretty quickly translated into, into the edge of the ski and onto the snow. So it's a really impressive option uh, for a lot of skiers. Um, you know, good in the bumps. It's stiff though, so you don't want to be skiing them the way, I wouldn't ski moguls on this the way I ski them on this, you know, where you can throw Just that shovel, shovel right, into the, right into the trough. Yep. Uh, it requires a little bit more of a touch uh, with the Core 87, but in terms of that edge-to-edge -edge quickness and your ability to get through the troughs and through the lines, uh, there's not much, you know, quicker or easier than this. I think it's one of the best mogul skis up here for most skiers yeah. because I would I would make the assumption that not many skiers are slamming their shovel into the next <laughs> mogul. Like I just don't think many right. people have that background. Like you have a formal competitive right. mogul background and that's how you were taught like to push down the backside of the mogul and shove your tip into the next Yeah, that's mo how you do it. Yeah, I understand <laughs> that that's how you do it, but that's not how most of, that's right. like not even how I do it. Like I'm more of a kind of wiggle through the troughs yeah. type of guy. Like we were skiing moguls at one point last year and you were like, yeah, you kind of started to get it in those last five turns. And I was like, I really have no idea what you're talking about, right. but thanks. <laughs> like, I, my skis go sideways. Right. Your skis go very straight. Because these are so light and because they're so agile, I think it's more of a benefit to most skiers yeah. than the downside as a mogul ski. Like most of us don't even like get going that fast in moguls for that even to be a concern that right. you're going to shove the tip into the next mogul um, so certainly something to think about like yeah look at yourself as a mogul skier if you're not like bob then you got nothing to worry about no and if you and you're right and and a lot of the times especially here in vermont and other places in new england our moguls are separated by firm snow right or ice right in, in which, which case, case this works you want great. this yeah 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 and on that bent 90 you just kind of be like You'd put them sideways to slow down some speed and just keep going. Right. Not that that ski's not fun, but that's kind of the give and take. Right. I like throwing them sideways in the moguls. Yeah, it's fun. I do too. You, ye you yelled at me and told me I'm not supposed to. <laughs> um, so, gosh, I, I'm really glad that we started talking about moguls because that was my initial reaction to this ski the first time I ever skied like the final production version of this out in Winter Park, yep. I was like, that is one of the best mogul skis that I can think of. And I didn't actually get to ski it in moguls then, but I definitely think that holds true. Um, yeah, I just, when I was introduced to the ski, I just couldn't help but think how good of a stow ski it is. Because yep. it carves, but you can take it into the trees, you can take it into the moguls. It's never going to feel too demanding. So this is the new Fisher Ranger 90. Kind of an interesting ski. Like I don't, I guess it's kind of like a narrower hybrid version of the Ranger 92 and 94 FR. I'm not really sure how you quantify this thing yeah. in comparison to their previous Ranger skis. It's more like its own new thing. I would say it's the outlier of the group. Yeah. So Poplar wood core in this ski, and that's actually an outlier too because the rest of the Rangers use Poplar and Beach, but we do get the longest shaped TI laminate in this ski. So full width underfoot, at least almost full width underfoot, it doesn't quite reach the edge of the ski, 
and then kind of extends into these wings through the fore and aft sections of the ski. And that's pretty much exactly where the rocker starts. Before we show that, just over 1800 grams. So not like Core 87 light, but pretty darn light, yeah. especially with a more traditional horizontal application of metal. Granted, right. there's not like a ton of metal in here, but it's still there. So kudos to them for achieving that weight. Speaking of that metal, that is right where the rocker starts. It's no so, accident. No. <laughs> it's by design. Um, but maybe the most rocker of any ski on this wall, I'd say that M Pro and, and the DPS when we get there, that's going to be an interesting, interesting comparison. Um, but quite a bit of tip rocker up here and really quite a lot of tail rocker too. So I'd say more tip and tail rocker than that mind bender that we just looked at. And if you think about the metal, the placement of the metal, that makes this ski even more playful. Yeah. So that's really where like the mogul performance, the tree performance, all that kind of stuff is coming from. It is very, very quick, very agile. It's not too stiff. You know, it's not like a tremendously demanding ski. It's pretty easy to, to manipulate. But on the other side of the story, or the other side of the spectrum, you still get enough carving performance in this ski to satisfy a strictly groomer day at yep. Stowe. So that's, like I said, to start, it just seems like such a good Stowe ski to me. Um, and I am interested how many we're going to see in the lift line this year. Yeah. Will we I, see more Ranger 90s or more Ranger 96s? I, I don't know. I would bet 96s just from... A marketing standpoint? I would too, but I would um, also make the argument that this is more appropriate on most days. Yeah. As like, a, if you're going to have one ski, daily driver ski, this is a great, great choice. Yep. And I like how Fisher is progressive in their construction throughout their Ranger line. So Yeah, it makes it all make a lot of sense. It, may, it makes a lot of sense. And then when you're saying, I'm a 90, you know, I'm a skier looking for something on this wall, you know, you wouldn't just jump to the 96. You know, you'd right. say, yep, no, that's, that's perfect. That has the right amount of metal, the progressive shaping, you know, the rocker right. that lines up with that, and so on and so forth, and that makes a, a great option. Right. The progressive differences that Fisher has applied to these Rangers, they don't, they're not designed to, like, give them drastically different performance. They're designed to maximize their performance for the intended terrain and yep. use of that width. Yep. So it's, yeah, it's a very cool, cool way to build a line of skis. Yeah. And it's, you know, I would say it's slightly different than like what Head does where they're all they, the same. They're all the same, just yep. different widths. Or Nordica. Yep. You know, we kind of had that similar conversation here where this, they just took the Enforcer 100 and shrunk it in every dimension. That is not how those skis were designed Correct. at all. Yep. They were all designed kind of not independently, but more independently. Yeah. So, kind of cool. Uh, we got a faction ski, Jeff. Yay! Are you excited? Yeah. Yeah. It's a fun one too. Um, this is a Prodigy One. Right up my alley. Yeah. This is an 88 millimeter underfoot twin tip. Yeah. You, you know, could. it's what more do you want? I'll, I think that I'll take this thing home. <laughs> in in you know in many ways this kind of is a little bit romantic for us because it's similar to a Nordica Soul Rider 87 insofar as that it's a real ski in that 87, 88 millimeter range. Yep. That's a twin tip. Yep. So, you know, they're, they're kind of getting away from making these 88 millimeter twin tips in real lengths and real builds. Yeah. A lot of them just seem to be more of a tweener ski now, and that's just the way the market's going. Well, that's kind of one of the reasons why I got so excited about this. Right. Because I was like, whoa, cool. Um, yeah, real twin tips. There's like engineering in that yep. ski, and it's not just like you took the cheapest wood core that's like left over at your factory right. and like threw it into a ski and put like a cool top sheet on it. And we're like, here you go. Right. This, it's a real, real build. Yeah. So, you know, good job by Faction for, you know, kind of sticking with that mentality. Uh, they use a blend of wood, so it's a poplar and ash wood core. Um, if we had a, an Armada ARV up on the wall here, 
uh, similar type of philosophy where they're putting ash wood into the core of a twin tip uh, in order to get it the strength and stability. Other than that, it's a fairly simple and straightforward build. These are considerably <clears throat> lighter than ARVs though. Yeah, 1800 and something change yeah. grams. ARVs, are, are, they get pretty heavy. Yeah, this is the 178. Um, and, you know, definitely more of that park-oriented ski for yeah, a, a more of a dedicated freestyle skier. Uh, and you're getting those thicker edges, you're getting that stronger build, nice consistent flex. It's not symmetrical like Revolt 90. No, which um, makes it a better all-mountain ski. Yeah. Hands down. Yeah, so you can ski this thing directionally if you wish. Um, we did look at that camber profile earlier, but just to reiterate, lots of long and high camber through this through this one so yep. they're building the energy into it you know not a ton of rocker some um, but again it's definitely mostly that camber underfoot that's contributing to uh, the overall energy of this of the prodigy one here so yeah quick um, agile light fun yep. easy to throw around yeah very easy to throw around you know this is definitely kind of in that category of uh, a park skier ski that wants to ski all mountain. Yeah. Um, whereas I'd almost take something like the bent and say this is an all mountain skier skier ski that likes that wants to ski park as well. Yeah. No, I'm glad you started with park on yeah. this one. That makes sense to me. Yeah, and they can, you know they go up in widths from this one as well. So yeah, you know hopefully we'll see more of those. But in general, they're using that camber to get the energy and really just in putting their freestyle influence into this one here. Yeah, but and these skis are here right now because you guys commented on so many videos and said, where are the faction skis? Well, here they are. Here they are. <laughs> um, and we're excited to have them. We had them in our ski test. It was really, really a lot of fun to yep. see, see faction next to all of our traditional, more historic brands for ski essentials. Um, Speaking of which, yeah, next ski is the Elan Ripstick 88. Uh, got, it's got a, this has got to be one of my favorite skis up here. I think it probably works really well for my size and how I like to ski. And, yep. and maybe you can chime in on that in a little bit. Um, but the Ripstick 88 is, is pretty unique and really kind of differentiates itself from a lot of the skis up here. It's 88 underfoot, so that's not different than a lot of the skis up here. It's directional. It shares similar shaping concepts to a lot of the skis up here, but it's quite lightweight. So we're under 1,700 grams in this ski. We have those, those carbon rods or carbon tubes that we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, we have left and right skis. There, there is a, a ton of unique characteristics yeah. to the design of this ski, just from like an engineering perspective. Um, and something that I think is important to talk about is it is one of the softer flexes of any of the skis up here. So that really changes its personality. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it's a soft longitudinal flex, but I feel like there's pretty good torsional stiffness in this ski. So it's designed with that asymmetrical profile, so we get more camber on our inside edge, stuff like that. Uh, we, they kind of boost the inside edge of this ski by adding a little bit more carbon yep. there too. Yeah. So although it's light and soft, for me, it holds an edge really well and it allows me to kind of like play around with carving turn shape because I can bend the ski more than I can bend a mind bender or an evolve or an enforcer or a stance or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera or more, some of the skis over there. Yeah. Core 87, like I can barely bend that thing. Right. Where this is very easy for me to bend and gives it just such a, like a big sweet spot and a very rewarding skiing experience in general. Um, and then the other side of the, of the performance of this ski is, it is so much fun off trail. Right. You know, to go back to talking about moguls and we're on like, we're on a pretty cool stretch of really good mogul skis here. The last yeah. four have all been like great mogul skis. So moguls, trees, anything ungroomed, because it's pretty light, because it's soft, because we get a decent amount of tip rocker up here, it really, it really performs 
notably well yeah. off piece. Um, so I think there are a lot of things to like about this ski. I am not 220 pounds or however heavy you are. So you have had a little bit of a different experience on ripsticks in general, maybe particularly non-black edition ripsticks. Yeah, and I would even expand that to lighter skis. Uh, sure. So head as well. Uh, the wider these get for me to a point, uh, the better they work. So, you know, at that said, when we skied with Alain this year and I got on this thing again, and, you know, I skied the 180 this, yep. this year, um, my main reaction is how can they make something that's shovel bends like that carve so well? Right. Whereas something like this, which is light, it's not. Not that's bending not. at all. So that's, that's like, yeah, and that's what I was trying to explain yeah. from the like soft longitudinal flex, but really good torsional stiffness. No, like, the f how does that work? I don't know. The first time that I skied on a 96 yeah. was just blown away at how the more angle you got, the better it performed. Yeah. So like you were saying, you can bend it, you can get it up on edge. I find a direct relation between this thing being up on edge and a higher edge angle and the amount of performance you get and those carbon rods are, are the answer. Yeah. Like they are the driving power behind these ripstick skis and Smooth, how they're... damp. It's cr it doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't, especially for how light and how flexible this shovel is. You know, yeah. they have the vapor tips in here, so they're even like going a step further and making these skis lighter in the shovels. Um, yeah, didn't you ask Alon for a, a Ripstick 88 Black Edition without vapor tips? Yeah. Similar to when you asked Kessley for an MX-88 without Holotech. They don't like and those And they looked at you like, no. <laughs> That's not <laughs> what we do. do <laughs> but, you know, in all seriousness, it is, you know, it's part of the, the charm of the ski. And I think for most people that are putting this thing up on edge, they want that. They want that yeah. more approachable shovel. Uh, that's able to engage and then get you really, you know, the shovel is not the meat of the ski no, in this one. No, it's the, the mid-body of the ski. Yeah. That's where you get the, the torsional stiffness and the grip. Yeah, from basically where that additional carbon laminate starts through yep. the tail is where this thing really starts to light it up. But, yep. you know, again, my biggest takeaway was how do they do it, you know, and, and the, the answer is the carbon rods. Yep. And that's... As simple as it gets. And we got a Dina Star M Pro 90. I would say this is pretty different from the last four. The last four. Absolutely. Um, but it's a little bit more of a departure from like really, really good mogul ski. Right. You know, one of the main things that we've talked about with these M Pro 90s is the tip shape and how that affects uh, the overall personality and character of the ski. Uh, 178, we're at 1,750 grams. It's actually lighter than I thought it was. There's a lot of skis in this, like, 1,800 gram range it's here. It's really impressive. Yeah. Like, um, not to, like, keep bringing up Nordica and, like, how the ski hasn't changed. Right. But that's one of the things that's interesting, is looking at the weight of this ski compared right. to all its competitors. And I feel like that's where we're starting to see some just shifts in the industry in general. Yeah. Is manufacturers are getting better at retaining strength and stability and vibration damping, but allowing the ski to be lighter too. Yeah. So this one has a unique build to it and unique shaping to it that sets it apart. Uh, a lot of it is like the like the Elan from here up, just in a little bit different of a way. Um, you know, very straight, very like just a slim rocker profile, uh, sorry, taper shape coming through here. Uh, the rocker profile is pretty dramatic, but the, the taper is not, yep. um, you know, and that allows you to take a pretty straight and direct line, um, a ski or ski, you point it where you want it to go, uh, and it will go there. Uh, once you get to the midpoint back, we're dealing with more metal, so full metal width underfoot, and then that metal goes pretty much edge to edge all the way to uh, this part of the tail here. So very much more business-like in the tail, yeah. uh, very opposite of the K2 in terms of where they're putting the emphasis on their metal. Uh, there's really not a whole lot in the shovel here, uh, but still pretty stiff. They use their hybrid wood core uh, with polyurethane material along the sidewalls uh, to create that effect. 
really interesting ski. It's like a very strong carving <clears throat> ski with a super versatile tip. Yep. And this is, that's the, that's the profile there, which is kind of crazy. Just an amazing amount of splay. It's not like it's like a smooth curve. It definitely kind of starts and then goes. Um, you know, and we had talked about that with like Stance 102 in the tail. Uh, this is like Dina Star's shovel version of that. So sure. really allows for good flotation. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't yank you into the turn uh, like a Kessley or Liberty does with that lack of taper, but rather allows you, the skier, to, you know, put your own mark on it. But from the midpoint back, it's all business. Uh, really great soft snow ski, good in the trees, but just a ripping groomer ski. Yep. And a very, very good choice and a very good tool for somebody with really good technique. Yep. A, a technical skier that you don't necessarily have to ski really fast. It's not like aggressiveness on this ski. It's it's your technique yep. and your ability to make different turn shapes and just control the ski in different ways. For some reason, I'm thinking of like a golf analogy of like how you can hit like different wedge shots around mm -hmm. the green. Like if that's how you can ski, if you can make subtle little subtle differences in your turn shapes and styles, you're going to love this ski because it allows you to do all of those things and you can you can really utilize the strength of the ski and do make it do what you want it to do. Yeah. Where some of these skiers feel like they have more of a distinct personality and, and more of their own preference of what they want to do and the turns they want to make. Yeah, and you can kind of look at it like it's an M free from, from here that, forward. Right. And, and then, then like a carving ski. A carving ski from there back. So yeah. really cool mix. Yep. So the next ski up here is pretty unique. This is the DPS Pagoda Piste 90 RP. Um, so RP refers to resort powder. I would say when we're getting this narrow, maybe the P doesn't make as much sense. Just resort? Just resort. <laughs> <laughs> maybe like RV, resort versatile. Yeah. I think that would be a better way to think about this ski than resort powder. But anyways, with that RP uh, in the title, that means we get a 15 meter turn radius in this ski. We talked about it in comparison to the QST 92. You just had an insightful comment that this ski is like a combination of the QST 92 and that Core 87. Right, like the shaping of that and then the construction of this. Yep, so DPS uses really high grade carbon fiber like aerospace grade, I forget the exact term for it. That sounds right. Yeah, but the type of carbon <laughs> fiber that they use in their skis, it doesn't break down as much as other carbon fiber. So in theory, the performance of this ski will be the same on day 1000 as it is on day one. Yeah. In practice, you're not gonna get a thousand days on this ski. Right, the but, wood's gonna break down over time. <laughs> right, but there is something to be said about DPS quality of yep. materials and manufacturing. If you're looking at the price tag of this ski and you're wondering where that's coming from, that's a big place where it's coming from. Yeah. Um, but pretty lightweight. We do have the uh, have the the demo binding track on this ski, so I'll just flash the weight up instead of throwing it on the scale. But still a very lightweight ski. Um, I find that although it might not come across in video. They don't feel as stiff as a core to me when I'm skiing them. They yeah. feel a little bit more supple. Um, and then if we look at the profile of this ski, it has a very short effective edge. You know, they ski very, very short. Um, you know, all that tip rocker there, which is pretty much synonymous through all DPS, at least RP skis. Some of the C2 skis don't have as much tip rocker. And then quite a bit of tail rocker too. So I don't even remember where we were when I was saying this ski is almost 50% rocker, but this ski is almost 50% rocker. With a ton of taper. With a ton of taper, yep. exactly. So they really do ski short. Um, they kind of counteract that by giving it that stiffness from the carbon. So there is probably more stability and edge grip to this ski than you would expect if you just like looked at a picture of it right. without knowing anything else. So pretty stiff carbon, so it's responsive. But I think the highlight of this ski is easily its agility. 
You know, sure. similar to the QSD92, yep. they're so quick, they're so wiggly. Wiggle factor is off the charts. Yep. It broke the chart, actually. Right, it's setting the bar. You had to create a new wiggle yep. factor chart because of this ski. So really, really good. I'd say East Coast tree ski. Yep. You know, I don't feel it. We don't really like pigeonhole skis very often, but this kind of feels like one that is at least more appropriate to pigeonhole than some. Like if you're uh, an East Coast skier, like I'm really thinking of Dave through the wall. Yep. Dave Hadoff, he skis backcountry more than he skis at resorts. He's always looking for soft snow, always looking for the trees, lives here in northern Vermont. If that right. sounds like you, this is a fantastic choice. Yep. And I think the same way about these, uh, the 90s, as I do about the core and the ripstick, where these carbon-based skis, for me, and I would assume for other bigger skiers, work better in the wider widths. So I yep. get along much better with, with, the, the, 100. with the 100 yep. in the RP than I do the 90. Uh, this one just feels just too, too, wiggly. too wiggly for me. Yeah, which makes um, sense. Which is fine, but I, I understand why and, and the benefits for, for other skiers. Yeah, do you think the Dave analogy was good? I do, and I think that that would work well for e you know either of these other carbon-based skis as well. Yep. But very interesting, super unique ski on the wall. Hefty price tag. Hefty price tag, but like you said, it's going to last a thousand days. <laughs> it's going to last a thousand years, but yeah, that's forever. True. It's It'll just be around forever. You just have the same ski forever. Yep, unfortunately. Uh, Blizzard Brahma 88, that thing wants to go. It's a fast ski. Uh, really, really, you know, one of these benchmark models. Uh, we put Kendo, we put Enforcer up here with you know a, a very direct comparison in terms of uh, performance and overall character as well as kind of just notability yeah you know this is this is a ski that people talk about uh, you get the you get the weight 2023 grams here in the 177 I believe yeah um, so yeah north of 2,000 grams we get the most metal out of anything here two and a half sheets there's even another little sheet under the binding zone there. So adding to the weight, adding to the stability underfoot. Um, they use their true blend wood core in this one to fine tune the flex of the ski per length. So similar to what we see in Kendo with the Taylor Titanal frame, uh, they're altering the amount of, or the length of the stringers of the wood that they're putting into the Brahma uh, in order to achieve uh, the desired effect. So a lot of sophistication going into this one. Also, just a lot of blunt material force. and force. So yeah, it's a, the thing rips. Yeah. It's so much fun. It is a ton of fun. But and it's I'd, also pretty one-dimensional. Yeah. And I fine. just answered a comment before coming in here uh, from a skier, you know, six foot, 270 pounds. Intermediate, wants to improve, wants a stable ski. Uh, you know, his size and his desire. Right, and negates some of the stiffness. Yep. So, you know, my advice was to maybe look at this size, yep. you know, like a little bit shorter than me, but heavier. Yep. Um, I like this in a 183. This is the only ski pretty much anywhere that I'm not seeking out the longest length. Um, I get along much better with the 183, and I believe you with and the 177. 100%. 183 um, is just unnecessary for me in that yeah. ski. Which is crazy, you know, and like <laughs> that that's that it makes such a difference. But, you know, this gentleman that I was conversing with, I felt like that, like you, he wasn't going to be totally overpowered, you know, heavier guy. Yep. So, and the desire to want something stable, I think, puts you in Brahma category. Yeah, that's it. And I'm glad you bring that up because, and that's something that we've talked about before is like, it's very easy for us to say like, oh, an intermediate shouldn't buy this ski. Right. But you can do whatever you want. Right. And if you want a ski that's going to feel a little hard to ski at first, but then you can kind of grow into it, yeah. that's fine. That's up to you. Right. So that's like, I don't want to like fault people for buying skis that we say aren't great for intermediates. No. I think like probably the, the example or the scenario where it might not be the best choice is if you took that exact same description of a skier but they were my weight. Right. It's like, eh, you're just not gonna learn much. Right. The ski is not gonna help you learn correct techniques. So, 
anyways. Yeah, and you know, this one definitely has that interesting shape to it as well. So very dramatic splay, but not a lot of rocker. So it really just kind of curves right yeah. out from the shovel here. That's giving you a pretty long effective edge. Yeah, and really precise turn initiation too. Yeah, this just hooks right up. Hooks goes, right up. Yeah. Um, very, very small rocker and splay in the tail. So like the tip hooks you up, the tail holds you to the end. Yeah. Um, not quite as scared off as we see in something like the Kessley. That's the free ride influence of this. This coming from, you know, I don't, you know, which which came first, the Brahma or the Bonafide? I'm, Bonafide. Okay. So if this is the narrower version, maybe we have some historians out here that can enlighten, but. I was working at a shop that was a Blizzard dealer, whenever that was, and I'm <laughs> racking my brain, and I'm pretty darn sure Bonafide came first, but somebody can correct yeah. us if we're wrong. Regardless, similar to an Enforcer, this is the, a narrower version of more free ride inspired skis, you know, going up to Cochise 106. Yep. So from that to Bonafide to this, uh, and then an 82 below, um, but a little different, 88 to 82. Uh, you know, it does have that narrower free ride ski feel that Enforcer has, just with a, I mean, it's a very different shape. If you want to hand me that Enforcer oh, there. Oh, yeah, much, much different. And it's the, mostly, Sure, there are a lot of similarities between these skis, but boy, there are some differences too. And yeah. I think it's important to consider those differences. Mostly pronounced here in the tail. I'm kind of lifting this the Brahma up a little bit, but you can really see the rocker of the Enforcer yeah. uh, giving it more of that free ride flair than uh, Brahma that is certainly more, you know, front side oriented. I saw an interesting discussion, um, not on our website, kind of discussing these two skis yep. and mentioning that this was more demanding. And I couldn't help but disagree with that a little bit. I feel like this is a little bit easier to ski than that. Especially yeah. with the changes that they've given it recently. I think, yeah, and I but think. But not quite as powerful. That, I'd still, th it's MX88 and that as most powerful skis up here. This thing is, is unflinching. Yeah, 100%. Like, you can get that to flinch. Right. You gotta push and you gotta try. Right, but it but can do it. As hard as you try, as hard as I've tried on a Brahma 88. I haven't gotten it to flinch. And I think there are more benefits for that 160 pound intermediate skier from a Kendo yep. than there are from a Brahma 88. No, totally. So just an interesting conversation. Yeah, but a cool ski with a really good, really good influence. Yep. So some of you may have noticed that this <coughs> ski is not the current graphic or the 2023 graphic. You're hundred percent correct. Kind of a bummer. Yep. Well, it's not um, here yet. Yeah, it's not here yet. We had it here for the ski test. We had to send it back. Yeah. Um, but there is a new Black Crows Captus for 2023. I think they're more similar than different. And I think probably there's more differences in the new Atris compared yep. to the outgoing Atris, where the Captus really stays pretty much the same. Um, we're not going to look too closely at this ski. Luckily, we do have quite a bit of footage of skiing the new Captus, so you guys can look at that while we talk about it. <laughs> Um, but one thing that they did do is they kind of extended the side cut a little bit. So to me, that just makes the ski, let's say, more responsive, just a little bit more precise. But it doesn't take away its playfulness at all. Um, I also, for whatever reason, think the new ski feels a little bit more like a true part ski. Yeah, it's more twin tippy. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or yeah. just my perception of it, but there's definitely 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 a freestyle application for the new ski there was for this ski too but i think if you're a park skier and you're shopping in black crow's line the captus is a better choice than it's ever been before um, actually a lot of similarities to the prodigy and just overall application in my opinion yeah and the bent 92 in fact maybe it falls like right in between those skis in, in overall application yeah but very fun um Fun is really probably the best word to describe this ski. It is just designed to be a fun, playful ski. Um, you can carve a turn on it. It's not going to be the strongest thing in the world, but you can do it. You can wiggle through the trees. You can do all that fun stuff. You can ski switch. You can go in the park. It's just a well-rounded, all-mountain twin tip.
Yeah, and I have said, you know, since I got on this a couple years ago, and it's changed, I think, twice since then, but... Was this your favorite Black Crows? My, it it was, at the time, my, yeah. my favorite Black Crows. I remember that. I would pair that with a Justice for a Two Skis Black Crow Be quiver sweet. any day. And then you could throw an Anima in there if you're, like, lucky to get a ton of right. soft snow or a Nocta. Yep. Yeah, I love that. But I, I love this thing, love skiing in the bumps. Uh, for my money, I would put it right up there with this Bent 90 as one of the best mogul skis on the wall. So right side of the wall is this mogul side. Quite a bit better at moguls <laughs> with a couple with a couple outliers yeah. like that Brahma. Yeah. But yeah, now that we're going through this, your side of the wall definitely wins for yes. mogul application. Um, but you know, I think this is a good comparison. You yeah. Know, we get tons of. I mean, obviously the Atomic is just getting tons of traction. Uh, it's a phenomenal looking ski. It behaves well. It has a ton of versatility. We, you yep. and I have both spent a lot of time on this one. Uh, if you want a little bit more snap and energy and just a slightly stiffer flex, yeah. uh, the Captus is a mildly better choice. Yeah, and I think a cool range of people that can ski it and really appreciate its, yep. its performance and feel. Like I can ski it with a train park background and like, was it Waterville where they had those rollers and I got to do a little yep. 180s and 360s and stuff? Like, that's really fun. But then uh, Mr. Dean Dekas was at our media shoot with Black Crows this year. Um, and he is, I don't, I don't want to, like, make him feel bad, but quite a bit older than me, older than you two. Yep. Not, like, elderly by any means, but more of a traditional skier, directional skier. He's not a park skier whatsoever. He's a guide in Chamonix. Yeah. Like he is, he's one of the best skiers I know, uh, but extremely technical from like a directional perspective. And he really enjoys this ski yeah. for very different reasons than why I really enjoy right. this ski. So a big range of people that can, can ski it and really enjoy it. And we've had this one up here before, just as a, com as a comparison, but Atomic Maverick 88, uh, you know, I think we contrasted it to what, the, the Scott maybe in terms of, that's so long ago. The thickness. The thickness of yes. the core. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was like, like a yes week ago. Yesterday, yeah. Um, but yeah, Atomic Ma Maverick 88 Ti, this thing gets a new top sheet for this year, um, but remains the same lightweight metal all mountain carving ski. Uh, this has a demo plate on it as well, so you know Jeff will flash up the the weight of this one. Um, but is one of the lighter skis on the wall. And another uh, good example of just that trend in the industry of like retaining strength while shedding yeah. weight. So yeah. Very very commendable to Atomic, and I, I'm sure we've talked about that like 20 times at this point. Thin wood core, thin metal. Yeah. Goes from sidewall, tapers two into cap. Metal. Two sheets of metal. Just, just Crazy. It like doesn't make sense. No. It's kind of like that Ripstick 88. It just doesn't yep. make sense. And and you know it is it is somewhat stiffer than you know the weight lets on. Kind of similar to the ratio of head core 87. Uh, but they also put their Horizon Tech in here. So it's yep. just similar to QST that they're putting a lot of different technologies into a ski from Horizon Tech. There's no you know, like there's no metal surrounding here. So this is a playful floaty tip. Yep. Same as what we see on Bent 90, Bent, all of Bents, yep. uh, and all of Mavericks. So very interesting to see them carry that technology through and then having the two sheets of metal, that stiff flex, that lightweight. Um, you know, I think that this skier is generally a lighter uh, person who is looking for a similar quality in a ski. Um, you know, you would probably have better success on this than I would. Yeah, I think that's um, fair. Just because, just like a lot of the other lighter skis that we've yeah. looked at, like again the Ripstick. Yeah, that it just is going to line up better for that skier who's, you know, when I'm putting my weight behind something this light, physics are just going to they're just going to push it through. Um, you know, that said, this tail is pretty darn strong and supportive. I yeah. have not found issue with this tail. Have you found that it's a similar phenomenon as um, a ski like the Pagoda 90, where as you go wider, they're more supportive for your size? So Maverick 100 yeah. compared to Maverick 88? Yes, uh, 100%. You know, and I would, 
The 95, I would say for me, more is like this than the 100, even though they're somewhat closer in width. But okay. um, sure. once you get past that 95 in the Maverick category, I think that that's where that lightweight boosts it a little bit. Yeah, for me, really works out well. Yeah. Um, but this thing is just an absolute like cleaver out there. It just slices through yeah. snow. It is what a so good adjective. sharp. Yes. Slices. Um, it, you know, and part of that is that thin core that it's able to just be sharper on the snow. Yeah. Which is a pretty cool phenomenon. Yeah. Good that Atomic is still putting their, you know, putting their emphasis on that lightweight and, and high performance carving. Another good mobile speed. I think so. You know, I wouldn't want to slam my tips into the. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, in terms of that lightweight and edge grip, certainly getting that core vibe yeah. where, you know, and especially when there is that gap from mogul to mogul, uh, if they're not perfectly spaced, you're going to need something to uh, help get grip, maybe make a, an extra turn in there. Actually, a really good comparison to that Ranger 90, too. Yep. A lot totally. of similarities between those skis. Light, very versatile, take them anywhere, yeah. do anything. And Very I would say this is this is more unique than uh, than kind of industry wide. You know, it's not a direct comp like we don't get questions about Maverick eighty eight versus Kendo. No, nope. eighty eight. You maybe know, that, they will. Maybe we will in a couple of years, but yeah. not yet. Yeah, it's just, uh, Enforcer eighty eight. It's just not. Yep. It's not a similar thing. It hasn't taken off yet. No, nope. none of the Mavericks have. No, but I think they're good skis, and I think you'll continue to see more and more of them. Yep. You probably will see more of these. You see a million of these. You're going to see a million of these. Yeah. Um, this is the new Bent 90. We did a long review of this ski this past winter. Uh, it was really fun because I got to like kind of center mount one, and Bob got to more traditionally mount one, and then we got to really do what we like to do on them. Um, but least expensive ski on the wall, I think, 499 here, and I'm pretty sure that ski is 549. That's the one that I'm not 100% sure of yeah. that could be, could be less expensive. But anyways, there is a ton of value in this ski. Pretty simplistic build. So this is kind of that example of how good a ski can be with just a wood core and the correct yeah. shape. Um, I liked when you described it as an all-mountain skier who might ski some park rather than a park skier who might ski some all-mountain. <laughs> um, I do think that is completely accurate. I think... I don't want to say better, but I think it's really, really good as a tree ski, mogul ski, yep. playful, fun, all mountain ski. We have seen people in the Olympics on this ski, like winning big air competitions and stuff like that. I actually don't remember who won the Olympic big air, so I'm probably so long wrong ago. right now. <laughs> but anyways, there were a lot of atomic athletes in the Olympics, in the X Games, stuff like that on the Bent 90. So yep. there is certainly that application for it. I really enjoyed it as a park ski. Um, 1,660 something grams in this 183, 184. Yeah. So it's crazy. Really, really lightweight. And that was actually something that I like almost had to adapt to in the park because I'm used to having a little bit heavier swing weight, which there's like sometimes a benefit to having mm -hmm. some swing weight because you can control your spin and like. You can control things a little bit more easily than if you have just yeah. like nothing on your feet. Where you can feel like yourself nothing. in the air. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I sort of got into trouble a couple times on this ski when I first was adapting to how light it is. But once I learned it, it's just, it's yeah. so much fun. Super, super easy to spin. And then you get that same benefit when you take it into moguls, into trees. It's just super quick. Just so light on your feet. Horizon Tech tip and tail in this ski to differentiate from that Maverick. So you get really, really easy edge release. You know, we get a good amount of rocker in this ski for something that's 90 underfoot. So it's very agile, yep. very fun. It's not the world's strongest carving ski. You know, it's, it's got a pretty bendy flex pattern. It's pretty bendy up here. So yeah, it's sure, it might leave something to be desired as a true carving ski, but it's not intended to be a Maverick 88. It's intended right. to be a Bent 90. Yeah, this is my current kid's ski. 
So when I'm skiing with my family and three young daughters, this is what I ski on. Yeah. And it is absolutely 100% perfect for that application. So like, you know, talking about range of skier, and we've talked about that with Bent 100 for years, and that is, I would say, almost amplified with the 90 because it's narrower and therefore a little bit better suited for a more realistic variety of terrain and snow conditions. Yeah. So, you know, for me, you know, mid 40s, I've got some old knees. I'm usually skiing tight, fun stuff with the kids. I do not want this on my feet. Right. You know, I want the, the, different, the different thing from that, right. <laughs> which is this. And it's so easy to put this thing where you want it to go. Um, easily one of the best tree skis and bump skis on the market today. Yeah. You know, other than a competition mogul ski, uh, I don't think I'd rather ski bumps on anything else. Which is so. quite a compliment. Right. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with this. Yeah. And you can really just fold this thing in half if you wanted to. It's so compliant. So, yeah, I don't carve turns on this thing. Right. I don't it's, think I've ever carved a turn on this ski. I have. It's fun, <laughs> but it's, there's, yeah. a, there's a limit to I mean, I've tipped it on edge and rolled it around. I don't but know if that counts. <laughs> I've seen my tracks. They then look it, like then cars. It counts. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I mean, yeah, it's no, like, 100%. I, I don't, I it's don't not take your intention. it up. No, not at all. Yeah. And when I do, if I get it up to speed, then there's, then there's this. Yeah. You know, it Which even I can feel. Right. At my weight. In the longest length that it comes in. Yeah. It, yeah, it gets a little nervy right but which is that's fine. not what it's designed for. right i don't ski it on trail i ski it off trail yeah like i'm like i would say 90 percent off trail yeah if i'm on trail on this ski i'm doing something wrong you've, you've taken a wrong turn yep, i have failed or your kids took a wrong turn and you're like ah, God, i gotta go chase them down. that's when it gets fun <laughs> <laughs> um and quite a bit different in this next ski huh yeah Last on our wall here, we got Armada Declivity 92 Ti. Uh, new top sheet for this ski, but remains the same awesome, wider, all-mountain ski. Uh, you know, it's tied for the widest on the wall here, so definitely has, uh, you know, the most surface area, at least, for off-snow, off-trail capabilities. It's not quite the same type of shape or philosophy as, like, Blade Optic 92. Or QST. Uh, or QST, you know, definitely more has like a Kendo vibe or a Stance 90 vibe in terms of on-trail performance. Yeah, the combination of QST 92 and Stance yeah. 90. You know, they do a good job, similar to what we were saying about Solomon, of using, you know, different materials and different techniques to achieve a certain effect. Uh, articulated tightenal banding is the big one here, really giving the ski the, the ability to flex torsionally, yeah. uh, but also keep that, that edge firmly in control. Uh, really good quality of sound and stability and dampness to this. Just um, feels like it stays glued to the snow when you want it to. Like a really high quality front side feel, yeah. similar to Stokely Stormrider in terms of that silent nature of it and really intuitive and smooth feel. So uh, unexpected, but very welcome from a more free ride, freestyle oriented company like Armada. Um, so we just get, you know, we get a lot of traction on these. Uh, just a great option for that advanced expert skier who's looking for a wider bodied, all mountain front side ski. Whereas yeah. some of these are a little bit more, you know, front side oriented specifically. You There's know. more versatility to this. Yeah, for sure. Kind of like maybe like a wider mind bender. Yep. Something like that. That's a good way to think about this ski. And when we don't have on the wall a Rustler 9 from Blizzard, yeah. uh, in a shorter length comes in that 92 underfoot. So, uh, you know, once you get below the 180 in a Rustler 9, you're looking at a, a pretty similar overall characteristic. And we do get a lot of uh, that comparison, Rustler 9 to this. Yeah, so. that seems like pretty common situation is, is choosing between those two skis, yep. which makes a lot of sense. And the wrestler is just going to be a little looser, a little more maneuverable with that tail rocker. Yeah. And this ski is a little stronger on trail. And another one in that 1800, mid 1800 gram range, 1870 here in the 180. It's so. actually lighter than I remember. Yeah. I mean, you know, we had, impressive. That, we had the 102 up here, which was, you know, certainly closer to 2000, if not yep. over, but uh, has enough heft to it to make it stable and smooth 
while also keeping it light enough to be maneuverable and playful and versatile. So, yeah, and it, it it's it's a strong carver. Yep. But I, it's not something where you necessarily feel locked into a turn. Right. Which I think is a nice characteristic for that ski, and definitely, it increases its all mountain capabilities. It's yeah. a good carver. You know, that's not like not concerned about that. It's more like when you get that level carving performance, sometimes they can get a little stuck. Yeah. And then you're looking at more of a one dimensional application. But yeah, I think you can you can do a lot on a Declivity ninety two. Yeah. I own a pair. And you love it. Yeah, it's turned into like my kind of go to directional all mountain ski. Like yeah. If I'm skiing with a group of people and, and I know I'm not gonna be like going into the park or catching big air anywhere or anything like that it's a fantastic choice and it, it really pretty much satisfies like everything i want to do on a directional all mountain ski yeah yeah and good camber underfoot you yeah. know it just definitely has that nice snap to it and when you decamber it that rocker you know with appropriate rocker pops right out so yeah just has that nice mix of attributes that this category is known for really known for yeah yeah there is, I would say, a noticeable difference between the 92 and the 102 in yep. the decl declivity line. That 102 starts to get really drifty and smeary. Still a good carver, um, but the 92 is, is actually, there's probably more similarities between the 82 and 92 than the 92 and 102. Yeah. But awesome ski. Yep. And fun one to end on. No, I agree. So that's it. Yeah. That was the, uh, the 2023 men's 90 ski comparison. Um, there are some skis up here that we could have included that we didn't. So if there's a ski that you're thinking of that you don't see up here, just leave a comment. Let us know. We're happy to um, give you our opinion on it and how it kind of fits into this mix. Um, and yeah, keep letting us know in the comments what, what we should do next. I saw, yeah. I saw one vote for 85s. I was I, like, oh, yeah. I, like, I like that. I saw bigger. I saw wider ones. Yeah, we'll probably go wider next. Yeah. So we started at 100, just did 90. I'd say like 110 or mid 100 would yeah. be a fun one to go to next because you really start to see in my opinion the wider you go the more differences you start to see among skis until you get really wide yeah. and then they're like all the same yeah and other than a few outliers here they're all kind of very similar in terms of the weight you yep. know like there are differences shaping and profiling for sure but you know like you said it, those those differences get amplified yep definitely so let us know if you have any questions. Keep an eye out for the next comparison video, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.